Hello. Thank you all for coming in this nasty weather. Someday it will be spring. My name is Gloria Gilman. I'm the chair of Philly Neighborhood Networks and the co-coordinator of Move on Philly Council. I would like to welcome you this evening to our Supreme Court Candidates Forum on behalf of these organizations, as well as our 58 co-sponsoring organizations making up our presenting coalition. You will see their names of the coalition members on the PowerPoint on the stage. We would like to thank PCN, Philly Cam Word, and MMP for their coverage of this event, whether it's being live streamed, reproduced by tape, or available on their websites. This race for Supreme Court is unique in all of our lifetimes because there's not been a time when three of the seven seats making up the Pennsylvania Supreme Court were open for election in the past 200 years. The Supreme Court justices elected for 10-year terms make very important decisions on policy and judicial procedure that ultimately affects all of our lives significantly. Yet few voters know anything about the candidates for these offices that we are responsible to select. So please pay careful attention tonight, then do additional research on the candidates and come out to vote for those you believe most appropriate to become Supreme Court justices on May 19th for the primary and then again in November. Tell your friends, your family, your neighbors that they can watch this event on the internet and repeat it on television at PCN and through Philly Cam and heard on WURD. Our moderators tonight are Holly Otterbein and Reggie Shuford, who I might be blocking. <laughs> Reggie Shuford is the executive director of the Pennsylvania American Civil Liberties Union. Prior to assuming that position in 2011, Reggie was the Director of Law and Policy at the Equal Justice Society for 15 years, raising awareness of the intersection of race and the law. During that time, he became the ACLU's Chief Litigator on challenges to racial profiling practices nationwide. He's a law graduate and was graduating class president at the University of North Carolina, which recently awarded him its Distinguished Alumnus Award. He also was a Harvard Law, uh, law School Wasserstein Public Interest Fellow and recently received the 2014 Minority Business Leader Award from the Philadelphia Business Journal, as well as the 2014 Humanitarian of the Year Award from the William Way LGBT Community Center. Welcome to Reggie, recently titled a 2015 CBS Philly Game Changer. Holly Otterbein is an associate editor at Philadelphia Magazine, where she covers the mayor's race and local government. Previously, she was a reporter for WHYY, the NPR affiliate in Philadelphia. She has also worked as a staff writer for a joint project between WHYY and the Philadelphia Daily News, known as It's Our Money, as well as for the Philadelphia City Paper. Welcome, Holly. The moderators will now introduce the candidates and describe the format for the evening. Kevin Dougherty, Democrat serving on the Court of Common Pleas, Philadelphia County, called me this afternoon to say that his daughter might have pneumonia and that he was on his way to take her to the hospital, so that sadly he's not likely to make it here this evening. Yesterday I received a call from Christine Dougherty, Democrat serving, oh Donahue, I'm sorry, <laughs> excuse me, uh, serving on Superior Court in Pittsburgh who conveyed her dismay that she had a conflicting fundraiser tonight and could not be here. Coriel Stevens, Republican serving on the Supreme Court, had hearings in Pittsburgh today and asked me to send his regrets for not participating. In total, there are six Democratic and six Republican candidates running for three of the seven seats on the Supreme Court. The questions that will be asked tonight were compiled by questions submitted by the 58 groups who are co-sponsoring this event. They are not the questions of the uh, moderators. Okay, let's, get, let's begin. Hi, everyone. Just want to say thank you to the candidates, to the advocates for putting this together, and to all of you for coming out. I think this is a pretty unique event, a judicial candidates forum, and it, of course, is very important. So here's how things are going to work for the introductions. Um, we'll be introducing every candidate by name, current position, and county, whether they've been endorsed by the Pennsylvania Bar Association, uh, or whether they've been recommended, sorry, and what their recommendation level is, their age, party, and if the candidate has received a party endorsement. Then we're going to ask each candidate to take about one and a half minutes to introduce themselves. 
and tell us which of their written opinions they are most proud of and why. Okay, Cheryl Lynn Allen is currently a Superior Court Judge in Allegheny County. Her candidacy has been highly recommended by the Pennsylvania Bar Association. She's 67 years old and she's a Republican. And John H. Foradora is currently the President Judge of Common Pleas Court in Jefferson County. His candidacy has also been recommended by the PA Bar Association. He's 48 years old and a Democrat. Good evening, everyone. I will continue with the introduction of tonight's candidates. Anne E. Lazarus is currently a Superior Court Judge in Philadelphia County, where she lives. Her candidacy has been highly recommended by the Pennsylvania Bar Association. She's 62 years old. She's a Democrat. David Inwecht is currently a Superior Court Judge in Allegheny County. His candidacy has been highly recommended by the Pennsylvania Bar Association. He is 52 years old, he's a Democrat, and has been endorsed by his party. Last but not least, Dwayne D. Woodruff is a judge of common pleas in Allegheny County. He is 58 years old. His candidacy is recommended by the Pennsylvania Bar Association. He is a Democrat. Okay. And now a quick explanation of how the forum is going to be structured. We're going, oh, I'm sorry, I actually didn't have you guys uh, introduce yourself, so why don't you go ahead and do that? I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, we'll start with uh, Ms. Allen. Good evening, everyone. I am Cheryl Lynn Allen. I am currently a judge on the Superior Court, as you have heard, highly recommended by the Pennsylvania Bar Association, and I am happy to be here tonight. I've served as a judge in Pennsylvania for nearly 25 years, 17 years on the Court of Common Pleas of Allegheny County, and since 2007 on the Superior Court. I have the, a very diverse background. I'm very active in serving my community. And I would like to talk just briefly about a case that I am most proud of, and that is the case of uh, N. Ray J.B. This is a case involving an 11-year-old child who was charged with a do double homicide. He was charged with killing his father's fiance and her unborn child. Um, anyone who is charged with murder in Pennsylvania is automatically charged as an adult regardless of their age. And the issue that was before our court was whether or not was involved this child's decertification hearing, an effort to send him back to juvenile court. And the issue was whether or not you could require uh, him to accept responsibility for a crime before he was actually convicted or adjudicated. And we held in that case that to require him to do so would be a violation of his Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination. Thank you. I'm John Fordor. I'm the president and judge of Jefferson County. It's great to be here in Philadelphia. Thank you, Holly, uh, and thank you for this wonderful event. Uh, the written opinion that I'm most proud of is Commonwealth versus All's House. Uh, for one, it was twice taken to the U.S. Supreme Court, but mostly because it involved an infant, about nine months old with a broken arm, uh, that break being witnessed uh, by the four-year-old brother of the minor child done by the father. Uh, interview by children and youth to uh, find out what went on and the child said that his father had done the uh, break. I wanted to give children a voice and I allowed, because the children and youth worker was in jeans, casual day, not expected for testimony, <clears throat> nine months after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Crawford versus Washington, I ruled it was non-testimonial. Uh, that case has been affirmed by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, twice and gives children a voice in their children and youth proceedings. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Judge Ann Lazarus. I have been fortunate enough to be on the Common Pleas Court in Philadelphia before I served on the Superior Court. And I've been found highly recommended by both the Pennsylvania and the Philadelphia Bar Associations, and I'm very proud to appear before you tonight. Thank you very much for conducting the forum. The case that I am the most proud of involves a case in which a defendant was found guilty, and the day after he was found guilty, a police officer was alleged to have been 
a bad cop. And the issue before the court was whether or not to open that case, the case is Commonwealth versus Castro. The case was written by the court on banc. I was the author for a unanimous court on banc. We happen to have gotten reversed by the Supreme Court, which is why I want to get up there. But um, it involves whether or not to reopen the case to allow some testimony to make a determination as to whether or not the defendant had been subject to an unjust proceeding. I think that case becomes very important because it goes right into my judicial philosophy. We are here to do justice. And the Supreme Court is here to make sure that all of us are subject to fair, impartial, and just tribunals. That's the whole purpose of having justices on the Supreme Court. So I thank you for being here, and I'll be happy to talk to you more about my philosophy as we go forward. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and I want to thank all of you and thank the organizers for putting together this wonderful program. I'm David Wecht. I'm proud to serve as a judge of the Superior Court of Pennsylvania, and I am the only candidate running for the Supreme Court who is both endorsed by our state Democratic Party and highly recommended by the Pennsylvania Bar Association. I'm also the only candidate who has issued a comprehensive ethics and transparency plan calling for reform and a restoration of transparency and ethics to our courts. I've been a judge for over 12 years, and last year I decided more cases and wrote more opinions and memoranda than any judge on the Superior Court of Pennsylvania. Before my 12 years of judging, I was twice elected Register of Wills of Allegheny County, practiced law for about 15 years. I ran the family court in Allegheny County, the second biggest court in this state, and I designed the Unified Family Court. The case I'm most proudest, the case I'm proudest of is the Cordes case. It was a medical malpractice case where the trial judge allowed three jurors to sit on the jury, even though they were affiliated with the defendant physician and defendant hospital. I reversed that case. I said, you can't have jurors who are tied to the physician in the hospital, especially in a day of multi-conglomerate healthcare facilities and hospitals that own real estate just like big corporations. Thank you. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Well, <laughs> I am uh, Judge uh, Dwayne Woodruff from Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I've been sitting in family, uh, presiding in family court uh, for the past uh, 10 years. Uh, I've also served on a number of uh, state committees, been appointed by our Supreme Court. In regard to the Rules Committee, which I uh, was vice chair, uh, JCJC, we review various legislative bills coming down uh, from our government. And I also serve uh, nationally on the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. Uh, I was appointed by our Supreme Court also to serve on our interbranch commission in regard to the Lucerne County Cash for Kids uh, issue as, as well, and coming back with over 60 recommendations uh, for our Commonwealth. Uh, I, I continue to, to serve uh, in Allegheny County, as well as across this uh, great uh, state, as well as uh, nationally as well. Uh, the case I, I am most uh, proud of and most uh, uh, informed with is, is TC versus the Commonwealth, uh, where I opinion in, in regard to children and their education that it's not just good enough to have a child uh, be in a safe environment and, and learning environment as well, but that child should also be progressing uh, through that environment. So uh, making sure that every kid is progressing and obtaining the education uh, that we all uh, so probably want for all of our children. Okay. Thank you so much to the candidates for all of your answers. Now we're going to start the debate. We will ask a question to be answered by all of the candidates in one minute. We'll rotate the candidate who responds first. The candidate to that person's left will then be the next responder, just as the introductions uh, went forward. And then when the questioning is over, each candidate will have one minute for closing remarks. Okay. <laughs> I know, it's, it's tight. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question is, in, in 2020, there will be redistricting in the state. And as many people have pointed out, the state is pretty gerrymandered. What is and what should be the role for the Supreme Court in this process? Judge Allen, we'll start with you. Well, first of all, with regard to the structure uh, of the panel that decides redistricting, the, the Supreme Court, as I understand it, I'm sorry. 
The Supreme Court is, I don't know if this mic is. It's on. We can hear you. The Supreme Court has the responsibility of appointing the fifth uh, person. The legislature, the Republicans appoint two, uh, the Senate and the legislature each appoint one Republican and one Democrat. And so the Supreme Court has the role of appointing the fifth one. But after all is said and done, and to the extent that there is a conflict and, and an appeal to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has the responsibility to do what is best for the people of this commonwealth, to do what is fair and just. This race is also always about justice. And you know, par politics, partisan politics, has no place in the decision-making process whatsoever. Thank you, Judge Allen. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I should keep them together. Okay, Judge Foradora, go ahead. Well, the uh, Supreme Court has the duty if the uh, two parties cannot agree on the th fifth person after the leadership, which has never happened. The Supreme Court normally appoints that person, so it's up to them to appoint a good and just arbitrator. Uh, then normally the case has come to court as they did last time. Now, one person, one vote has been the law of the United States since 1962, but it's not being applied appropriately. In this day and age of computerization and mapping and GPS, we should be able to get dis districts that are equal, that can be competitive, and that allow for selection of the best person. And that's the job of the Supreme Court to ensure that justice. As they did in 2012, initially turning down the map, but then disappointingly, accepting the uh, second map. In my personal opinion, the map should be equal. The law is set forth in Baker versus Carr and its progeny should be followed. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Since you've already heard about the process, I won't go into that, but the last three times that the, sen that the census was done and that redistricting was done, we have not gotten a fair redistricting map. E everybody can tell you that. What has happened in the past is that there's been a Republican majority on the court and the map has favored the Republican request for the map. I'm not saying that the map should favor either the Democrats or the Republicans, but a fair redistricting map and a fair map that allows people who live in a particular area to vote for a representative of theirs that comes from the area without having to go all over a very circumscribed map is the kind of map that we're trying to get that's the kind of map that we want from a fair court. A fair court has to be representative of all of the regions in Pennsylvania, as well as Democrats and Republicans. Thank you, Judge Wecht. Yes, uh, let me be very clear. Gerrymandering is an absolute abomination. It is a travesty. It is deeply wrong. The Supreme Court has a critical role to play. The Supreme Court appoints the fifth member and exists at the end of the process to determine the constitutionality and lawfulness of these districts. These districts have been drawn to disenfranchise the majority of Pennsylvanians. And they have been drawn by skilled political operatives and it needs to stop. There are a million more Democrats in this Commonwealth. I wanna let that sink in, a million more Democrats in this Commonwealth but there's a Republican state house, there's a Republican state senate, and there are only five Democrats in the Congress as opposed to 13 Republicans. Think about it. Do we need a new Supreme Court? I think you know the answer. Thank you, Judge. In regard to gerrymandering, again, uh, it, it is an issue. It will continue to be, be an issue. Uh, but the role of the Supreme Court justice is to make sure, again, that it's fair and that justice is, is applied. We also have to look at uh, what we call stacking as well, taking two Democratic committees and stacking them to, together uh, to re receive one type of electoral vote. That's an issue as, as well that needs to be, uh, that needs to be stopped. Uh, again, we have so many Democrats in, in the state. Uh, again, they're so important uh, that uh, we elect our officials, particularly our Supreme Court justices. You know, we, we only get you know, one crack at the apple when it comes trying to appoint a fifth a person uh, to redraw these particular lines. I, I think we have to go back to the drawing board in regard to redistricting as a whole, because it is a problem, it's unfair, and it's unjust. 
All right, thank you. The Robinson Township case struck down Act 13, which took away local zoning authority over gas development activities such as fracking. Three of the justices found the law unconstitutional under the Environmental Rights Amendment. What factors do you think the Supreme Court should take into consideration when deciding cases that involve the ERA? Um, let's start with Judge Foradora. Well, I think uh, with the issue of fracking and the horizontal drilling, it's near and dear to my heart because it happens. I can see wells just a short drive from my house, and we had one well drilled on my community's water authority. Fortunately, we got that stopped after just one. When you're looking at environmental issues, the thing that we need to look is at the scientific evidence or lack thereof in some of these areas because that uh, article in the Constitution guarantees the right to good, healthy water and the appropriate use of Commonwealth lands and our environment. And we need to stand by that for future generations and not uh, simply sell out uh, in hard economic times or for other uh, interests along that line. So it's very, very important that we follow the amendment that was handed down in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 10 guarantees to the citizens of the Commonwealth an environment that is free of danger, a healthy environment for them to live in. And because of that, what the Supreme Court needs to look at in terms of balancing is the balance of the developers. We want to bring in new jobs, but we want to make sure that whatever jobs are brought in don't do any harm to the citizens who live in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvanians are entitled to clean water, water that's not going to harm them, and a situation that does not create infrastructure damage to where the mines are created. If that's the case, then I think the Supreme Court has to look at what are the chemicals that are being used with regard to fracking, what kind of transparency there is, and how those chemicals are going to affect the environment that people are living in. What are the long-term effects as well as what the com Commonwealth is being looked at? Thanks. The, uh, the Robinson Township case was a very important decision. It, it was a decision that arose in my county, Allegheny County. And it's very, very important that everybody in this room recognize that unlike our federal constitution, we here in Pennsylvania are lucky enough to have an amendment that specifically says we all have a right to clean air and clean water and a, a, a pristine environment in our constitution. And it's critical that the people who are local, the people who are on the ground in an area, have the right to make their own decisions and exercise sovereignty over what's going on in their environment. The Robinson Township case secured that, and there will be a continued onslaught on those kind of rights in the future. And we can't put money over the inheritance of the environment for our kids and our grandkids. We should always remember that. We're not just dealing for ourselves. We're dealing with posterity here. You want a gas grill, drill in your front yard or in your backyard? The way that this economy is, is going now, that's exactly what could happen. You can wake up one morning and look in your front yard or look across the street and see a, a drill going in. That's what we're dealing with. Those are some of the things that are going to be coming before the Supreme Court. Yes, by all means, we have the right to clean air and clean water. But we have to fight for that. And so that's why it's so important that you elect some justices that are willing to fight with you. Because that's what it's going to take. As we go on, with all the money that's coming into the Commonwealth now, because of fracking and drilling and different things, it's not going to stop. You know, we, we, we have a, 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 a state here that is wealthy in regard to those type of resources, gas and, and oil and different things. And so that money's coming in, and they're, they're not going to care because they don't live here. We live here. And that's why it's important uh, to make our local governments, our municipalities, in charge in regard to setting up ordinances as to where gas drills, even if they come in, are going to be continued. Thank you, Judge. Judge Allen. Well, when we 
And I, I don't want to repeat everything that has been said. That's the problem with being last. However, we do have to remember at all times that people matter and that people must come before profits. And it is critical that we recognize that. People come before profits. And it's the role of the Supreme Court, as we've said many times before, to see that justice is done and that justice is carried out in such a manner that the population <clears throat> of this state benefits. Okay. The Ohio Supreme Court Chief Justice ran on a slogan that he would not accept any contributions from anyone, including himself, and he won the race. This created a meaningful public discourse <laughs> on the question of the influence of money in politics. What do you think of keeping private money out of judicial elections? Let's start with Judge Foradora. Oh, I'm sorry, Judge Lazarus. I was reading the old <laughs> order. Dark money creates a lot of problems in judicial elections, but our Supreme Court of the United States has unfortunately said that it it's allowable. I think the Citizens United case changed the whole landmark uh, and the framework of running for elections. Five years ago, I was absolutely, totally in favor of judicial elections. I think it's important for judges to be able to go and meet people and go to 67 counties and talk to them. And much like a jury, if you can get people from 67 counties that all agree in different geographic areas that this is the right person, it's probably the right person for the position. But dark money changes the whole landscape, and there's no way that we can counterbalance the effects of other money coming in on elections. And there's no way that any candidate can raise that kind of money. And I don't know that based on what our United States Supreme Court has done, we can have a fair election with that kind of money coming in later on. Thank you, Judge. It's an interesting idea to have public financing of elections. Politically, I don't think it's ever been considered in Pennsylvania, and I don't know whether it has any political uh, realism to it. Our Constitution provides everybody the right to vote for their judges. If the people choose to amend that, they can amend that. You can amend that. This year, there will be an election. And this year, I can guarantee you in this general election, after this primary is over between us, between four of us, uh, and two more. Among the four Koch years. brothers, the Koch brothers are coming, and they're going to play here. So there's going to be big secret money coming in and flooding our state from big interests. And it's important that all of you educate yourselves and educate your friends and get them out to vote so that the people's rights aren't taken away from them uh, in support of uh, big money from uh, out of state. Thanks. The, exp <clears throat> the expense of a campaign keeps a lot of people out of the, the race. A lot of good people that would like to run don't run because of the cost of trying to raise money, contributing your own money, uh, and different things for a race. So that's one, one issue. Uh, one of the other issues is, you know, we want to have, this is elect, judges are elected. We want everybody's vote at the count, everybody to have an understanding of, of what's going on as, as well. One of the, uh, the things I was talking to a number of you here uh, this evening, and one idea I think should be considered is reducing the cost of judicial candidates in regard to commercials and, and mailings and different things so that everyone has, has a good shot. Uh, that's something I, I, you know, I, I hadn't heard before, but I think it's something that should be considered uh, here in the Commonwealth as well, to give everybody an opportunity to run, and so that we can have everyone that's qualified, that's good, that, be, uh, that could be, uh, as sits in our Commonwealth, uh, able to run as well. Thank you. I firmly believe uh, in the election of judges, and Keep in mind, I am a person who has never had dark money, light money, or any other kind of money, and I don't have it today. But I am running because I believe that for me to sit back and watch what's been going on in our court system and not seek to make a difference uh, means that I really don't have a right to complain. Money corrupts. 
our judicial system. Because it's very difficult, and I don't care how righteous you are, it's very difficult um, to give the appearance of, uh, or not have the appear, to have the, not avoid the appearance of impropriety when someone has given you thousands and thousands of dollars. And I don't care whether it comes from the Koch brothers, whether it comes from big labor, or where it comes from. It's very difficult to sit and be fair and impartial when you have those kinds of influences. So I believe that uh, we do need to look at how ju judge candidate candidacies or campaigns are financed. Thank you, Judge. I love the fact that in Pennsylvania, the people get to decide who their judges are from their local magisterial district judge or here in Philly municipal court judge up to the justices on the Supreme Court. It's a lofty idea and it's good for the people and good for the courts. When I ran for county court judge in 2001, I sponsored and paid for my own campaign because I didn't want to raise money because of the appearance. I thought about doing that in this campaign, but looking at the money coming in, I didn't think it could be done. And so I went off and raised money and I am raising money. Not myself, as all of these candidates, as a judicial candidate under the rules, we're not allowed to ask. So you make contacts, your staff asks. That's the fine line the court's created. There's no question from an appearance standpoint and from other standpoints, it creates some problems. Hard to say what our US Supreme Court, maybe in a year, we'll know that judges can ask, which is gonna create more problems. I just think it is time to look at this area because it is deadly to the court's integrity. So Philadelphia is a very engaged uh, community, so <laughs> we have a lot of questions and a full agenda. So I want to thank the timekeepers, too, for keeping us all uh, on track. Um, the next question, and we'll start with Judge Wecht with this one. Since there is a right to public education under the Pennsylvania Constitution, what do you believe the role of the court should be in evaluating the adequacy of a thorough and efficient public education? Judge Wack. Thank you, Reggie. I have four children and they all attend public school. And I am deeply troubled by the gutting of our public schools. Uh, it creates a ripple effect that devastates our communities. You can see it in Pennsylvania. I can see it in Pittsburgh. We can see it across the Commonwealth. And we have to put our children above the profits of entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs can thrive in our economy. Uh, and um, that's the beauty of the market. But the interest of the children can't be sacrificed on the altar of the almighty dollar. And that's what's going on. I think it's, a, it's absolutely essential that we remember that our children have a constitutional right to an education. And I know that each and every person in this room is aware that that right has been deeply compromised. And the dollars are being sucked out of the public school system and the courts need to be a backstop to enforce the constitutional right of each and every child to a good education. In Allegheny County, I'm known as the educational judge. And I, I hold everybody accountable to a child's education. I'll subpoena and bring in teachers, superintendents, counselors, everyone, uh, to make sure that a child is not only in school, but he's in a safe environment and that he's progressing through school as, as he should. It's, it's not only a constitutional right uh, for to have a child have a good education, uh, but I believe it's unconstitutional if he, if he doesn't. And we have to make sure that we stand on top of that as, as, as well with, with our children. And I have three kids. Uh, I have a doctor and two lawyers. And my youngest is also a first lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps. Education is what got them where they are today. And if we want to continue uh, to enjoy what we have here in the Commonwealth, if we want to progress and continue to get better, then we need to make sure that we're educating our kids uh, the proper way. And public education, all three of my kids graduated from public high school as well, that's the way to go. And we need to make sure that we hold everybody accountable. Education is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I am a former elementary school teacher, 
and I did my student teaching right here in Philadelphia at 25th and Diamond William Dick School. So I am very familiar with the issues and the problems in our education system. Coming from a working class background, I also understand that education is the equalizer. And but, because but for a strong public education, I would not be sitting here as a superior court judge. Having said that, I think we have to be honest because everyone sitting at this table um, was in a position to make a choice as to whether, where their children went to school. Public school in an affluent community um, or to send their kid to a private or a parochial school. And I do believe that people who don't have the financial resources to make those kinds of choices um, deserve to have their children in safe public schools which provide a quality education. Well, I think it's important to note that uh, I believe the governor's budget this year addresses the fact that uh, it's not going to help education to cut money out of our good public education system. My son James is in fifth grade at the Brockway Elementary School, the same school that I started at, and that education should be equal with every other public school in the state, and that's what we have to ensure as Supreme Court justices, that we follow the Constitution, and that the Constitution and the cases that come before us are treated fairly. Education is the great equalizer for people of all walks of life, and we need to ensure that on the Supreme Court. Not to repeat what my colleagues have already said, but what the role of the Supreme Court will be to make sure that they are the fail safe so that when there is a case that comes before the court in which children who have not been given the choice but must go to public school are given the same type of education that everyone else in the state gets. That's where the Supreme Court's gonna be balancing. Now, I cannot make any pledges or promises as to how I will judge a case on its merits, but I can promise you that as a Supreme Court justice, I will weigh all of the factors and make sure that everybody is treated equally under the law, which is what they're supposed to be done, and in addition, to make sure that the Supreme Court acts as that fail-safe for equal access to education, just as equal access to justice. Thank you. Now, I want to give you all a heads up that this next question is long. <laughs> so bear with me and really listen to the actual question. There's a preamble that kind of goes on for a while. Here we go. Pennsylvania Supreme Court justices are administrators of the whole court system as well as judges. Many believe that poor people and those with low income have difficulty gaining access to the courts in civil matters. The Civil Justice Coalition has recommended that the court establish an access to justice commission as many other states have done. Such a commission would study and recommend measures to improve access to justice for unrepresented people. The Civil Justice Coalition report containing this recommendation laid out a number of matters that a commission should study and implement, including whether there are certain minimum practices that Pennsylvania courts should establish, such as help desks or online forms, etc., and whether there are best practices that should be shared. After consulting, still reading the question, <laughs> after, almost there, after consulting with his colleagues, Chief Justice Castile, the honorary chair of the coalition, said no to the recommendation. So here's the question. It's actually a couple. Do you support an access to justice commission? And if so, what will you do to make it a reality? Also, what would you do to promote diversity on this commission? We begin with Judge Woodruff. 
I guess the simple answer uh, to that is yes. Yeah, I, I do uh, uh, support access uh, to justice. Uh, I believe that our Supreme Court justices have too much on, on their plate now. Uh, they should be working and in, inciting cases. Uh, the, you know, we're not administrators uh, per, per se, uh, but judges are, are cast in, in, in that role. One of the things that we've done in, in Allegheny County, we've tried to become more transparent. Uh, we've tried to, to, to provide other opportunities uh, for those uh, that uh, have economic problems to come in and, and get before the judge. It, it shouldn't take six months, nine months uh, to get in, into the courtroom before a judge. And that's what's happening now. And, and, and families continue to, to suffer during, during that time. Uh, part of the issues uh, that, that solve that with Supreme Court Justice, obviously, uh, to get with some of my colleagues, hopefully, you know, two of the other ones are sitting here with me uh, uh, today as, as well, and, and talk about this issue because, you know, Supreme Court justices need to decide cases. The administration uh, and, and different things should be done in a separate matter. So simple answer, yes. Judge Allen. As a former neighborhood legal services attorney, I recognize the importance of access to the court system, particularly as it relates to civil cases. I agree with Judge Woodruff. I believe that the Supreme Court has its plate full, and I would like to see greater county control um, or administration over such access, because I believe that every county in this state is different and has different needs. But I, yes, I would support um, a committee to uh, increase and explore ways to increase the access, and I also believe that diversity is important. We have a diverse population. Uh, diversity in the court system is critical. Thank you. Judge Fordor. Yes, I would uh, support an Access to Justice Commission. As uh, the president judge of Jefferson County and the only judge in that county, um, I've always asked attorneys to come and help. Uh, we have forms online. Each of my staff have forms at their desk and are available because I know I see a lot of cases come through court. The court staff sees a lot of cases. For most people, it's their one case, and it's the most important case. We need to be patient. We need to help those people along. But normally, if you ask uh, the local bar anywhere, there's people willing to come forward and help. I do believe the commission will have to look to each county. There should be diversity statewide. I mean, looking north of me, if you think I'm a small county, Cameron County is attached to Elk. It has less than 4,000 people and no regular court staff there. So there'd have to be something different in Cameron County. There's only three active attorneys in the bar. Um, I love Cameron County, shout out to them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're much different even than my county, and certainly my county is different than Philadelphia or Allegheny. So I support the commission, and I support diversity on it. Great. Judge Lazarus? With all due respect to Justice, Chief Justice Castile, I think he made a mistake. We do need an access to justice commission. I'm the first judge that was recognized by the Pennsylvania Bar Association for an access to justice program in creating a judge's pro commission in, here in Philadelphia. I'm also currently active on our Civil Gideon Commission here in Philadelphia as well. Not only does this have to be led by the Supreme Court because the court leads by example in, and 37 other states can't be wrong when they have access to justice commissions, but in addition to providing pro bono avenues, the other way that we can help is to help level the playing fields by having help desks, having community legal service access, and doing all of the things that make sure that citizens have adequate legal representation when it comes to houses, children, and custody. Those are the rights that Civil Gideon recognizes and has recognized that are every bit as important as criminal representation. Thank you. Access to civil justice is critical. I absolutely support the commission. I think it's, it's absolutely wrong uh, that we don't have it. And I, I don't just talk the talk, I walk the walk. I was appointed by the Supreme Court to run the Family Division in Allegheny County. And in that capacity, I developed the first comprehensive parenting coordination rule because a lot of the custody cases keep coming back and coming back and coming back. And we needed to get away from a conflict-based model toward a solution-based model. And I put that rule into place there. One of the other things I did was I ensured that in the PFA and the custody cases that we had counselors available to assist people in their times of difficulty 
and that we worked with neighborhood legal services to ensure adequate representation. We also set up a help desk uh, in, the, um, in the atrium of the family court uh, for the first time. And it's especially important that diversity be afforded on the commission because the people who are served are reflective of the diversity, particularly in the urban areas, the underserved people, the people who are not getting access to justice and who are getting bad results because they don't have legal representation. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question. Do you think the compensation system for appointed counsel in criminal cases currently works? And do you personally support more parity between defense counsel and district attorneys in the resources, in the resources available to them? We begin with Judge Allen. Well, every county is different with regard to how it compensates the de uh, defense attorney. So that's really a, a difficult question to answer. But with regard to the district attorney, the public defenders, um, I believe there has to be parity. And I was faced with this issue as a juvenile court judge, where, where at juvenile court where I served for 12 years, um, because this very issue came up with regard to how parents' attorneys were compensated versus prosecuting attorneys from children and youth services. Um, we've seen in Allegheny County the district attorney's office with, with far, far more resources than the public defender's office. And yes, I believe our Constitution, I, I know our Constitution guarantees every uh, defendant and every litigant equality and equal justice under the law. So I do believe there needs to be parity. Thank you, Judge Fedora. As a former uh, assistant public defender and a person who did uh, conflicts for defense counsel in eight different counties, as well as represented parents and children in children and youth matters, there certainly is problems statewide with the adequacy of defense and compensation for attorneys who are doing that work. Uh, it has to be addressed in a county by county basis. I uh, would say when I first took office in Jefferson County, I made sure that we r raised and equalized those wages and our county commissioners have stood by that. I also have to point out some concern from the prosecution side since 9-11, 2001, the amount of forfeitures that we see in counties that's really the business of criminal justice, trying to make money. I think that's a concerning uh, situation that the Supreme Court's gonna have to take a look at because we have lots of people with no convictions who are forced to give up property without being tried in a criminal case. And that's an atrocity. Thank you. When the American Bar Association does an evaluation of our public defender's offices and our capital cases and finds that they're being paid the equivalent of about 10 to $15 an hour, you recognize that there's a tremendous disparity between what the defenders and the prosecutors are getting in terms of salaries. As a judge, I'm not sure that we can deal with that issue other than to require that people be competent when they represent indigent defendants. Competency is also a measure of how much they're getting paid because unless an attorney is being paid a living wage, they're not willing to take the cases. When we find out that people who have been represented are being determined to have ineffective assistance of counsel, that's really a measure of how much their attorneys have been earning in, to a large degree. Not only do we have to provide for minimum standards for defense counsel, but we have to make sure that they have equal resources to present their cases as the Commonwealth does. There's no question about it. Thank you, Judge Wack. Here's a question for you folks. What's the only state out of the 50 states in our union that provides no state funding for the public defender offices around the state? Is it Mississippi? Is it Arkansas? Is it Idaho? No, it's Pennsylvania. Is that an outrage? It is an outrage. There's a right to counsel. There's a right to counsel. And it is dishonored deeply by the failure of your General Assembly to fund the defense of people accused of crime. That person could be you. It could be your neighbor. It could be your family member. It could be anybody. Justice is a process. It's not a result. Once we put our fingers on the scales and corrupt the process, we take a step down the road to tyranny. 
There's entirely too much results-oriented judging that goes on. And the measure of justice is the measure of justice is given to the despised just the same as it is given to the exalted in our society. And it is wrong. It is wrong when your state Supreme Court chastises lawyers who've been court-appointed to represent defendants. Those lawyers are trying to do their job with no resources. And I hope that you will not only elect justices committed to justice, but also legislators committed to justice and toward providing an adequate constitutional defense. Without having adequate counsel, it's almost impossible to even think about having anything close to justice. Uh, by all means, everybody needs to have an attorney. One of the, the things, I was appointed to the Interbranch Commission of Pennsylvania uh, a number of years ago to deal with the Discern County incident. The issue there, for, particularly for juveniles, not having the right to counsel. Over 5,000 kids were affected. Many of those kids were sent to detention centers for not just a couple weeks, for years. That's a problem. I sat on the, uh, uh, the Pennsylvania Juvenile Court Procedure Rules Committee, and we instituted a, a rule that every juvenile that comes in the courtroom has a right to counsel, and they cannot waive counsel, uh, particularly when any type of disposition that removes them from the house is in, involved. And so that's how important it is. And we're dealing with our children, they should have counsel as well. Parents, when they come in, we're dealing with taking their kids away. Uh, from them and place them in other facilities because they can't care for them, they need to have counsel as, as well. The state funding definitely needs to be changed. Thank you, judges. I give you Holly. All right, the next question. There's always a great deal of discussion of the role of trial judges in sentencing. How much discretion do you believe they should have? And do you generally favor changes that would give trial judges more or less discretion in the length of sentences that they impose? Judge Foradora. As a trial judge who do, does sentencing, <laughs> dues, I, was, uh, I was proud to be selected as one of four judges statewide on the strategic planning workshop for the uh, sentencing guidelines. We're gonna have a report. Uh, I don't think the guidelines need to be changed. They've been affirmed uh, time and time again, and they are discretionary. I think what we need to do is have more access to more programming to make sure that nonviolent offenders, veterans, people with mental illness have a place to go other than to our county jails and state prison facilities. And that needs to be the type of discretion that's there. The guidelines are reviewed every so many years, and they're appropriately uh, allowed to allow judges to state their reasons to go above or below. And I think it's been a good system in Pennsylvania, but I do think we need to have more programs to divert offenders who are nonviolent and need of services. Great, Judge Lazarus. When I meet people on the street, people every once in a while say to me, are you tough on crime? And my answer is, if you or your brother or your sister or a member of your family was in front of me, do you want me to be tough on crime or do you want me to be fair on crime? In order for a judge to be fair and to do justice, which is what we're supposed to do, a judge has to have the discretion to do what's right in each case, taking into consideration the guidelines. But thank God our United States Supreme Court has said that the guidelines are not mandatory anymore and cannot be mandatory. Judges are the people that are trying the cases, or a jury is, and they have the best way. They're the people that can best determine what is the right sentence for a particular defendant in their courtroom? Now, judges are not infallible. We make mistakes, just like everyone else that's in this room here tonight. But for the most part, we study the pre-sentence reports. We study what is available outside. We make sure that what we do is justice. Thank you. Trial, trial judges need to have discretion. They're the ones who see and hear and feel the evidence. We shouldn't be handcuffing them with crude, generalized standards. Now, at the same time, we don't want the trial judges to have unfettered discretion. I've reviewed cases where the trial judge looked at the, looked at the defendant and called him an animal, called him a monster, called him a devil, a demon. Okay? So you want appellate courts to be able to review the discretion of the trial judge. 
But these mandatory minimums are deeply problematic because this mass incarceration warehouses nonviolent offenders and turns them into violent offenders or turns them into victims. And forget the goodness of your heart. Think about your pocketbook. We spend a lot more money, a lot more money housing these prisoners and feeding these prisoners and dealing with these prisoners than we spend on kids. Wouldn't it be a good idea if our General Assembly took a, took a little bit of that money and used it for pre-K education instead of mass incarceration? You know, the pipeline to, to, to prison uh, is, is, a, is a huge issue. And everybody knows what the response should be. Uh, but for one reason or another, and I believe it's economics, uh, there, there's no, been no change. There needs to be some type of change, uh, particularly when, you're, when you talk about discretion for judges. By all means, judges need to have discretion. I sit in family court. The one thing, when you look at Allegheny County, you look at our numbers, that kids are being incarcerated. It continues to go down every single year. That's because we have judges that have discretion. We have judges that understand that kids make mistakes. By all means, we have to hold them accountable uh, for their actions, just as we do adults. But we don't throw away the key. The idea is, what can we do to have some type of restorative justice? And without discretion, there is no true justice. I sat for five years in the criminal division of the Court of Common Pleas of Allegheny County. And I can tell you that during those five years, I saw relatively few, perhaps 15, 20% uh, defendants who I would consider criminals. The masses of people who come through the criminal justice system have drug problems, have substance abuse problems, alcohol, and who have suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and all other kinds of life issues um, which cannot be addressed through the prison system. And so I believe that the court, uh, the judges have to have discretion. They have to have the discretion and the freedom to create uh, specialized courts to deal with some of these issues that cannot be addressed in prison. Um, those who belong in prison should be in prison. And I have no hesitation about that. But I do believe that we have to uh, address the problems of our society in more creative ways. The prison system cannot handle all of these people, and we cannot handle the expense. Thank you. The next question is also a long one, not as long as poor Reggie had, but <laughs> please stick with me. Ours is a diverse commonwealth, and law is a diverse profession. Yet on our Supreme Court, there are no people of color, nor are there any out LGBT people, and there's only one woman. On the Pennsylvania Superior Court, there's only one person of color. The Supreme Court also creates numerous commissions and boards related to the work of the court system. One of these is the IOLTA board, which creates funding and allocation of funds to organizations representing poor people. This board is made up solely of white people, while the principal beneficiaries of its work are minorities. OK, here comes the question <laughs> soon. Since it's important that all aspects of our appellate courts reflect a greater diversity, what role can the Supreme Court justices play to promote diversity in the justice system? Let's start off with Judge Lazarus. Well, the first thing is, look at who's on your Supreme Court. If you get a more diverse Supreme Court, they're the ones who pick the people who sit on all of these boards. So you want diversity on your court, that will be reflected in the people that they appoint. Second of all, I don't know if people recognize it, but there is already a racial and gender fairness policy that was created by our Supreme Court, but it doesn't seem to have been followed, or maybe it's been followed with um, not the best rate of success. And I think that the Supreme Court that will be seen in the next year with three new justices will be very aware of the fact that all of its boards need to reflect diversity in the community, both in race, gender, 
um, sexual preference, although that is not currently a protected class in Pennsylvania, although I hope that changes personally. Um, we'll be getting to a question about that. <laughs> I bet, I'm sure you will. But that type of diversity has to come from the top. And how the Supreme Court deals with it at the top will be reflected in how they appoint each of these boards. Thank you, Judge. I'm the son and grandson of immigrants who came to this country to escape persecution and embrace the diversity of this country. I think diversity is critically important, and I think it's time that the committees and commissions that our Supreme Court appoints be opened up beyond the good old boys network and be opened up beyond cronyism. Does anybody here have any idea what the system is on how these appointments are made? How you get appointed to a rules committee? How you get appointed to a commission? No, of course not, because the justices of the Supreme Court just hand these out like so many plums. That needs to stop. There ought to be recruitment, there ought to be outreach, and there ought to be diversification, diversification of all of these groups. And by the way, I'm the only candidate who's proposed ending nepotism, not in our grandchildren's generation, but now. And why is that important in connection with this question? Well, you know what? When judges appoint by nepotism, they're appointing people who look just like them. Thank you. Judge Woodruff. I guess my first uh, response in, in regard to diversity begins with you. Uh, on May 19th, uh, you pulled the lever number six for Judge uh, Dwayne Woodruff, and that would give some diversity to our Supreme Court. Before we have any type of diversity on any of these committees and different things, we need to have some diversity on our Supreme Court. We haven't had any diversity of color on our Supreme Court since Justice Nix from Philadelphia. He's the only elected Supreme Court justice that this Commonwealth has had. And we have one of the oldest appellate courts in the country, over 300 years. I think it's time to have someone else of color on the bench. And I'd like to, I'd like to be that person. And I tell you, when we look for diversity, we already know that it makes corporations and everybody else more profitable, more efficient. Our Supreme Court needs to be more profitable and more efficient. Thank you. Judge Allen. Well, needless to say, I agree wholeheartedly <laughs> with Judge Woodruff. <laughs> and I'll take it a step further. There has never been an African-American woman elected to our Supreme Court. And so I am hoping to be the first. But diversity, <laughs> diversity is critical. We live in a diverse society. And I have all, I, you know, on my 25 years, nearly 25 years on the bench, I've been very concerned about what I see coming from the Supreme Court, not only in terms of appointments to commissions and boards, but even it, with regard to the appointment of administrative judges. I believe that some of that responsibility should rest with the county, because every county is different. And I have seen cronyism, favoritism, um, you name it. The only f consideration that a judge justice should take into account when appointing is credentials and qualifications, and then diversity. And so I am a proponent of diversity. I am happy to be running in this race. Um, because the only way we will have diversity on the court is when a diverse uh, group of candidates run for the office. Thank you. Diversity is what has made America great. And uh, there are three positions. So after you pull the lever for Judge Woodruff and Judge Allen, uh, let's, <laughs> let's put some rural people on the court because <laughs> rural people have no representation either. You know, and, and coming from the rural area I do, I, I look at it more personally, because I don't know how I got appointed to the committees I got appointed on in the Supreme Court. I didn't ask. They asked me. It should be open, the same as when I took over the president judgeship, that all jobs became posted on our county website and advertised in the paper and posted on job sites. So we can look towards that. And you have to keep it in mind that we want to have a diverse group of people. 
because there's diverse group of people coming through the courtroom doors. And I think that's what the Supreme Court has to do. There should be a way that we all know, every attorney and every person in the state, how people are getting appointed to the committees that they are and what their qualifications are. And that will change with the new Supreme Court elections. Thank you. So as promised, here's the question on the lack of protections for LGBT people. Um, there is no legal protection in the Commonwealth based on sexual orientation or identity. For instance, except in a few municipalities, including Philadelphia, a person can be fired without recourse for being gay. Describe the relationship, if any, you see between LGBT equality and civil rights, and what do you think are the most pressing civil rights issues today? Let's start with Judge Wecht. LGBT equality is, is a critical aspect of civil rights. I believe it's the civil rights issue of today. And equality means equality. It doesn't mean second class citizenship. Just as the freedom marchers knew, as Dr. King knew, as all the people fought for the equal rights of African Americans and continue to fight to this very day, there are many people fighting for the rights of LGBT persons and we have seen great advances in our country. But great advances remain ahead. And I'm sad to say that in this Commonwealth, we are once again in the rear echelon. We are once again behind the times. We have no hate crimes bill. We have no hate crimes enforcement. Our ultra-conservative legislators again and again vote down protections for LGBT individuals. The rights of the transgendered for everything from freedom from persecution to the opportunity to have gender-neutral restrooms are constantly challenged by ultra-conservative lawmakers. The courts are here to enforce civil rights, and if elected to the Supreme Court, I will remember, I will always remember my responsibility. Thank you. When you talk about uh, LGBT uh, and, uh, being uh, a civil right, you know, I, I definitely agree with that. You know, uh, I just recently uh, started reading about the, the Windsor case. I believe it, it was a correct decision to be made, uh, yet it leaves more questions than it, than it does answers as well. On the Supreme Court, as well as any other court in, in this Commonwealth, in fact, in, in this country, we should be all about justice and fairness. Not because someone's black, not because someone's white, not because of their sexual orientation or, or, or their, their creed or any of those things. We talk about fairness for everybody. Because first of all, we're all different. You have to understand that. And I'm not just talking about black and white and Hispanic and Latino, but we're all different. But we have more things alike than anything else. So we may not have the same type of hair, the same type of color. Uh, when we walk in, our teeth may not all be straight and different things, but we expect to receive justice in, in the courtroom. And so regardless of our sexual orientation, whatever it may be, you know, a Supreme Court justice uh, has to is be fair and just, and also goes through the integrity of our court as well. As a Supreme Court justice, justice is paramount in our court system, and justice applies to every citizen, every citizen. And we, you know, with regard to discrimination, in employment, discrimination in housing, discrimination in education. Every citizen has a right to fair treatment. I do believe that our legislators who are elected by the people of this commonwealth, they have the responsibility for writing or making, determining what the law is. As judges, as Supreme Court justices, our job is to interpret the law and we must interpret the law in a fair and just and impartial manner. I became a judge because I wanted to help people. And I want to help more and more people by going to the Supreme Court. Of course, the LGBT issue is a matter of civil rights and a matter of equality because everyone comes to the court in equal stead. Everyone in the community should be treated with equal stead. You know, scientifically, back in 2000 when they unlocked the human genome, they determined that on every human being on the planet, there's less than one-tenth of one percent of different markers in all of us. When we have so much in common, can't we be more accepting of the commonness that we have rather than picking out the differences? The Supreme Court needs to address this issue and needs to ensure that all people are treated equally.
the most important thing that happened to the LGBT community last year didn't happen because the legislature passed laws protecting the LGBT community. And it certainly didn't happen because Governor Corbett was in favor of the end to the ban of same-sex marriage. It happened because a judge in our courts in your county had the courage to say, it's time for this to be over. What you need to understand in this room is that you need to have justices on the Supreme Court that have that same type of courage and can see inequality when they see it and can rule against it when they see it. That's the kind of justice that I hope that I will be if you get me to the Supreme Court. That is the most important thing that we can do as Supreme Court justices to make sure that everyone is treated equally under the law because that's what our Pennsylvania Constitution requires. Thank you. I'm going to take a break now. <laughs> Reggie, it's all yours. I'm going to break. <laughs> No break for the candidates, just, just yet. <laughs> not, not yet. Bear with us. Describe any decisions you have made related to abortion. Has your campaign been endorsed by and or associated with a pro-life or pro-choice organization, and if so, which ones? Judge Woodruff, we start with you. Uh, I, uh, I have not been endorsed uh, by any uh, organizations uh, that uh, favor uh, abortion uh, or, or uh, pro-choice as, as, as well. Uh, in, in my courtroom, uh, and, and, you know, I follow the law, uh, what it is. Uh, it, it should be noted, you know, I, I have, uh, my wife is here uh, of 37 years. Uh, as of May 13th, it'll be 37 years. I get points because I remember. <laughs> uh, and and we, have, we have three children. Uh, uh, my Otis is, uh, uh, lives in D.C., she's 36, and I think Janice is 30, 31, 32, okay, and my son is, is younger than that. Uh, and, and, and I tell you, you know, that, that's, you know, that was our choice. I'm, I'm glad we have them. I have three grandchildren as, as, as well. Uh, they're a light of our, our life. I always tell everybody, if I'd have known grandkids was this good, I'd have had them first. Uh, but no, I not, have not received nor am I seeking any, any endorsements. Oh. I have been endorsed by the Pro-Life Federation of the State of Pennsylvania. I have been endorsed by Life Pac. I am pro-life. And I make no apologies for that. But as a Supreme Court justice, we are bound by the law. We are bound by precedent. And as a justice, I will interpret the law as I am mandated to do. I have uh, not been endorsed by any of the PACs on either side of the issue. I have not sought uh, the endorsement. and. Uh, in regard to the cases I've heard, they've all been with minors who've come to the court in regards to asking uh, to have the court allow them to seek an abortion. In those cases, I appoint an attorney who's learned in the field and have a hearing. All of that, of course, is sealed, but I can say if you read the case law, there have been judges reported and judges reversed, and that's never happened to me. I have not been endorsed yet, but I am seeking the endorsement of both Planned Parenthood and now. <laughs> and I make no apologies for that either. <sighs> I can tell you that when I was a common pleas judge in Philadelphia, I did handle parental bypass cases and where I determined that a young adult had the capacity to make that decision, I allowed them to make the choice for themselves because I think that's what choice is all about. I do believe that this is a partnership. You need to make sure that the legislature passes the laws that you want. I will make sure that I enforce the laws the way they are supposed to be enforced, because that's my obligation as a judge. Let me be absolutely clear. I support and defend the right of each woman under our Constitution to a safe and legal abortion, if she so chooses. And guess what? So does the Supreme Court of the United States. The law of the land is Roe versus Wade, and people should get used to it. And you don't want justices 
You don't want justices or who are going to crusade to try to cleverly erode a woman's right to make determinations about her own body. I respect the views of those who disagree, and I respect the views of pro-life people, but those are not my views, and it just so happens those are not the views of the Supreme Court of the United States, so people should get used to what our Constitution is. I have not sought, nor will I seek, the, the endorsement of the pro-life group. I spent a lot of time filling out the Planned Parenthood questionnaire. Hope they endorse me again. I'm waiting. Uh, they endorsed me last time for Superior Court. So did now. Hoping they endorse me too. You're entitled to know that your Supreme Court justices will follow precedent and will not seek a la Antonin Scalia to erode the constitutional rights which are enshrined for all people. Thank you, judges. The next question is Longish. <laughs> Longish. America. In case, can you turn up the heat? <laughs> <laughs> can it be any warmer on the stage? I'm not sure. America is home to 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. As we speak, there are 2.5 million prisoners in the United States. Since 1981, Pennsylvania's prison population has increased sixfold, from almost 9,000 to nearly 54,000 inmates currently. That's larger than the population of Harrisburg. In her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, Michelle Alexander says nothing short of a social movement is necessary to cure America's incarceration addiction. Do you agree or do you believe there is also a role for the judiciary? If so, what is that role? Start with you, Judge Allen. As I said before, I served in the criminal division of our Court of Common Pleas in Allegheny County for five years. And I have come to believe without question that the dramatic increase in the prison population is due largely to the increase in drug addiction and drug trafficking in our, in our communities. That is the main reason for it. And when we go back to the early 90s when uh, President Clinton um, revised the Federal Crimes Code uh, and put in the mandatory sentences, and, those, and Pennsylvania certainly followed suit with that, the mandatory sentences as it relates to drug trafficking has increased our prison population beyond, beyond control. Um, needless to say, because of the way our drug laws are enforced, African Americans and poor people um, tend to be the main uh, victims because drugs are enforced in the streets and not necessarily in the corporate suites. And we need that kind of equality. But yes, we do have to address the pr uh, proliferating prison population. And I believe that if we have more programs, more specialized courts, because as I said before, the majority of people who come through the criminal justice system are not hardcore criminals. They are people who suffer from drug addiction, from substance abuse, and other problems of life. The U.S. Supreme Court uh, took a big step towards changing that with the United States versus Aline case, which outlawed uh, the mandatory sentences of certain nature, and our Superior Court has currently uh, issued opinions which have said just about every mandatory, if not all, are no longer in place. That is a huge result of the uh, what the prison population has become is from drug mandatories. There has been some discussion and what the court's role is. The court is the arbiter or the overseer, the administrator of all our treatment courts in Pennsylvania. Now, it has not elected to set up a treatment court in every county and that may not be necessary, but what it should do is ensure that every judge, along with looking at the guidelines, is looking at the programs that are available to help people who are drug addicted, who have mental illness, to try and stem this tide and avoid the daily incarceration and the cost to the Commonwealth and to everyone else. Not only the money cost, but the human and emotional cost. When I served 
on the Pennsylvania Commission for Crime and Delinquency back in the 90s. We told the then governor, if you build them, they will come. If you build prisons, you'll get prisoners. If you build schools, you'll get scholars. In Pennsylvania, it was felt to be a quick fix to incarcerate people and to provide jobs through building prisons. I don't think that that's the way that we should deal with people who are not hardcore criminals. There should be a veterans court in every county. There should be treatment courts in every county to divert people before they have a criminal record to the appropriate treatment courts. But the courts can't do that by themselves. This has to be a coalition between the counties, the courts, and the legislature. In order to do that, we need to divert certain funding to make sure that people have the services that they need to deal with mental health problems and to deal with drug treatment problems. But again, if you build them, they will come. So let's not build any more prisons. Let's build treatment centers. Prison, prisons are a big business in this country. There's a lot of money involved. You know, we spend, I'm going to be off by a few dollars here, but give or take, we spend about $12,000 a year educating a child. We spend about $40,000 a year per inmate warehousing them. And we're improving their criminality. We're turning nonviolent offenders into violent offenders. So people may think it's out of sight, out of mind. It may be out of sight for now. But it shouldn't be out of mind because when these guys do come back, now they're violent and they're unemployable, and they're on the streets, and they are going to offend, and they are going to recidivate. Because we thought we were being, quote, tough on crime, unquote. We were being tough on ourselves and stupid, and we were spending money to boot. So you need to elect, you need to, in my opinion, you should elect justices who are attuned to our Constitution and who are attuned to the realities and will scrutinize sentences not only for their constitutionality, but for uh, the practical realities of life in this commonwealth. Thank you. Yeah, we talk about veterans court, uh, mental health court, drug court, all those uh, different types of court, and I believe that they're all good, and they work. But a kid, a child in the third grade that's not up to par in reading on level, that's when they started counting the number of beds that they're going to build. Third grade. Kids is not on level to read by the third grade. They start building the, the prisons. We talk about justice. We talk about equality. All those things we talk about. We're never going to get there until we have a different stream, a different look, a different perspective in regard to education. How do we fund our education as, as well? It shouldn't matter because of your zip code, the type of education that you receive. But in this country, it does. And that, that's, that's a problem. We need to revisit that. Uh, and, and, you know, when we talk about all these different issues in the prison and building schools in Pittsburgh, they, they're closing more schools than they're opening. And I'm sure they're doing the same thing here in Philadelphia. So we need to talk about education and get it up to par where it should be. Thank you, judges. My last question is long. <laughs> but important, I think. In the aftermath of non-indictments of police officers and high-profile matters like Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and Eric Garner in Staten Island, New York, calls have been made to require the appointment of special prosecutors when there is possible police criminal behavior. These incidents and others resulting in the deaths of African-American men at the hands of law enforcement, including Walter Scott in North Charleston, South Carolina, just this week, have given rise to Black Lives Matter a grassroots movement demanding greater accountability of police and respect for black lives. The recent report by the DOJ about the use of deadly force by the Philadelphia Police Department underscores the gravity of this problem. Given the, Supreme's court, given the Supreme Court's supervisory capacity over the court system, would you advocate for the requirement of appointment of special prosecutors in cases involving possible police misconduct rather than the current reliance on the grand jury process led by local prosecutors who have an inherent conflict due to their reliance on co cooperation with local police officers. Judge Fordora. Black Lives Matter, all matters that, 
all lives that come before the court matter. That's what this country stands for, and these matters need to be investigated. I think if we just look to last week's decision from our Supreme Court on the Cain case, it highlights some of the problems with grand juries and their secrecy and the way that things are handled. And the court asked the legislature to revise that. But I certainly think it could also be revised from the court because they granted the fact that the court had the inherent power to appoint special prosecutors. And in situations where there is an inherent conflict in the local policy, I think it's highly appropriate and almost demands the fact that a special prosecutor be appointed from out of the area to ensure what the appropriate justice should be because all lives matter, and if there's a murder, the person should be charged with murder and allow the jury to decide in a public trial, not a secret grand jury proceeding. You know, when a judge is involved as a party or a witness in a case, it's standard procedure, at least in Philadelphia and I think in every county, that we get an out-of-county judge to hear that case. I don't understand why it would be different for us to ask the prosecutors to do the same thing. It's got to be an inherent conflict of interest and we oversee conflicts of interest all the time and we don't let lawyers practice in cases where there are conflicts of interest. These are inherent conflicts of interest. We're asking prosecutors to deal with cases in which they are supposed to be investigating police officers that they deal with every day in terms of prosecuting crime. It's not fair to the prosecutors to put them in that position, but more importantly, it's not fair to the citizens of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that have to rely. It's often said that a prosecutor in a grand jury proceeding can indict a, a banana peel. When it doesn't happen, you have to wonder why and is it as, as a result of a conflict of interest. Bringing in a separate prosecutor takes care of that whole perception and appearance of impropriety. The question was, in, in uh, police-involved uh, deaths, uh, ought the Supreme Court to consider appointing a special prosecutor to displace the DA, just like they appointed a special prosecutor to inquire into the grand jury leaks in the Kane case? And the answer is yes, and for shame that they haven't done it. And I, in Allegheny County, I can tell you I've seen many, many cases where black men were killed by police officers in suspicious circumstances, and the DA refused to prosecute. So I'm not mincing words here. The answer is yes. And look at that video you saw on the news this morning. Did you see that video? Does anybody think the local DA would have charged that police officer if there had not been a camera? No. So we do need, we do need to get our Supreme Court involved in making justice a possibility a possibility, and it's not a possibility when you have the DA who's working with those same police officers who he or she is supposed to investigate. There's no question we need special prosecutors in these types of, types of cases. Over, over the years, there's been thousands of grand jury investigations across the country. There's been a less than a dozen that come back with no indictment. I have a six-year-old grandchild. I can prep him to go in and win a grand jury for an indictment. It's not that difficult thing to do. And when you look at it, it's so disproportional. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's definitely em embarrassing. Uh, but in, and we talk about justice, you know, we see these videos, we see it, we see less than that of all those cases they bring in the courtroom, then we see the deaths on live on screen and we can't get a grand jury to indict? That, that, that's, that's ludicrous. And, and the reason, again, because I agree with the issue of there being a conflict of interest. Get the prosecutors living there, he's talking to these people day in and day out all the time, and he's just putting what he wants before the grand jury. We definitely need a special prosecutor in, in these types of cases. Thank you, Judge Allen. Because I, we all know that it is critical in our justice system to avoid the very appearance of impropriety, I believe that a special prosecutor in many of these cases is essential. I believe that it is important to not put a prosecutor in the position of having to uh, come against 
someone he works he or she works with. And I believe that it is the only way that the process can be transparent enough so that people will have confidence in the outcome and trust in the outcome. And having said that, I agree with Judge Foradora that all lives matter and that we as a community have to be sensitive to each other and concerned about each other. All human life matters. Thank you, judges. Holly? Okay. Um, this is a rather wonky question. As you know, the Constitution allows municipalities to have what is called home rule. What standard would you apply to determine whether a matter is solely within the purview of a home rule municipality or subject to legislative preemption? For instance, uh, without stating how you would rule, what standard would you apply in determining whether a local minimum wage ordinance or a public banking ordinance could withstand preemption? Let's start with Judge Lazarus. The federal rule government reserves that to itself which it requires in order to run the federal government. That's what federal preemption is all about. The state does the same thing in terms of running the state government. I think it would have to be an analysis of whether or not such a law was required for the state to run its own government or was it already a matter of federal preemption. On the Superior Court, we've had a number of cases that deal with the mass torts and, and the argument has always been made that this has been preempted by federal court rulings and we make a determination on the court as to whether or not the specific statutes involved require federal preemption or require a matter of federal importance as opposed to something that can be looked at and ruled on by the states. That's the type of balancing act that a court would have to do. Thank you. If, if it's a home rule municipality, as obviously you are here in Philadelphia with your very robust charter, then you can only be preempted if the state government, if the Commonwealth government has clearly occupied the field, as we say in the law. However, in most of our, and we have home rule in Allegheny County where I uh, live as well, but in most of our Commonwealth, uh, most of the counties do not have home rule. And therefore, there needs to be enabling legislation to allow them to legislate uh, in anything that could conceivably be in derogation of state law, even conceivably. So there's a patchwork of laws across this commonwealth that touch on this issue, and we do a, try to abide by a principle of limited powers. So the rights are supposed to belong to the people if they are not reserved to the government, but we have a very confusing amalgam of laws in this area, uh, and we do have uh, 69 different counties. So we have sets of ordinances which would, conf 67, 67, um, 60 judicial districts, 67 counties. Um, and so we have um, a patchwork of laws and not every county has a similar system to Philadelphia with its charter. You know, I also live in one of those uh, home rule uh, uh, cities, uh, being in Allegheny County as, as, as well. And there are a number of different laws. And, you know, one of the problems that, that we have is going from one municipality to the next municipality and there being different rules uh, wherever you go. Uh, that is one of the issues that we're going to come up with in regard to fracking as, as well and other uh, uh, type of resources uh, throughout this uh, state as well. You know, having different municipalities, different rules as well. But at the same time, I, I think it's imperative uh, that if I'm living in Allegheny County, uh, my rules and, and my things that happen, uh, the, the rules in Allegheny County, uh, they don't have to be and should not be the same as they are here in Philadelphia County or in Jefferson County uh, where uh, a Judge Fedora is. And so it's imperative uh, that every municipality uh, has their chance uh, to make their rules and, and to live by those things because those people are the ones it affects. And you want to vote for something that affects you and you should have the right to be able to do that. There are federal laws and areas uh, which are of unique concern to the federal government, and there are local laws. And I think we saw this, con this conflict with regard to um, immigration uh, when we saw the state of Arizona attempt 
to pass uh, laws governing immigration, which was the purview of the federal government. Now, just as Judge Woodward said, we live in a, I live in a, a home rule uh, charter state, I mean county, and that county has 130 municipalities in it. 135. <laughs> 130. <laughs> Sorry, 130. The corrected, correct. 130 okay. municipalities. And um, on some level, there has to be some unity or some, some um, parity of all of those laws because many of those municipalities are tiny. And, you know, you cannot have a situation where in every area, a municipality can address every area of the law and pass different laws. There are some things that are left to the state. There are some things that are left to the federal government. Thinking through all five answers before me, I was thinking back to my days at Notre Dame Law School, my uh, conflict of laws professor standing in front of me and say, tell me everything about preemption in a minute and 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> The, the reason that there's home rule charters is for people in their individual municipalities to decide things and how they want to live and what their regulation should be. If the states garnered that area, then they on their face can't. But I think it's important to look back just to Robinson Township because that was an area that the state preempted and said, you can't have local ordinances that restrict drilling. And our Supreme Court said, no, that's an unconstitutional law. The local municipality gets to prevail because of the amendment or the article, one section 27. And that's the area where we've got to be looking. If the state has preempted and the municipality wants to make a ruling, is it their constitutional right to do so or is it the state's? And that's the balancing and fairness that the Supreme Court has to bring to the situation. Great. So, Glor Gloria pointed out um, earlier that most of these questions are um, provided to us by advocates. This question is my question. <laughs> That's the um, only one that isn't. Can you so make it longer? The question is longer. <laughs> it is so brief, <laughs> actually. Um, and, and some of you have touched on this already, but uh, I'd love for all of you to do so. Are you going to start asking what capitals are? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Uh, do you believe? the judges should be elected, and why? Let's begin with Judge Wecht. Yes. <laughs> Shocker. So uh, our Constitution gives you, each and every one of you, some of you are pretty young, but I think you're all over 18, uh, the right to vote, the right to pick your ju ju judges and justices. Do you think somebody should say, I'm smarter than you. I know who your judges should be. I know better. I got news for you. There are rogues on the federal bench, just as there are rogues on the state bench. I've seen it. Some of you might have seen it as well. Appointment is not a guarantee of quality. There are many problems with this system. And I bet you could assign any of one of us to debate either side of this debate, and we could all do a good job debating that. But the burden is on those who want to take the rights out of your hands and put them in the hands of a privileged few. That's who the burden's on. I also believe in judicial elections. Now, I'm a product of it, being, being elected and being the number one vote getter in Allegheny County uh, 10 years ago. But I also believe in qualifications. There needs to be a minimum set of qualifications. But also on the back end, one of the issues, we have two judges, or two past judges of Southern County that have a new residence now in one of those prisons we've been building. Both of them are in prison now. Uh, neither one of those judges were, had any type of judicial education once they became judge. In, in, this, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, once you're elected, once you put that robe on, you don't have to go to another class, you don't have to go to another program, you, have to, you don't have to deal with any educational assets at, at all. That's a problem. In Allegheny County, when I came back from uh, Lucerne County, we took our recommendations. We are the only county in the Commonwealth that has voluntarily agreed to have judicial education to the tune of 12 hours uh, plus an hour of, of ethics. That's something that I brought uh, to Allegheny County. That's something we need to have in our Commonwealth as well. I believe that judges should be elected. 
I believe that you, the people, have the right to choose, the right to decide who your judges are. I believe that judges should face the public and that judges should be accountable. I was, the pri I was privileged to receive an appointment uh, before my election to Common Pleas Court in 1991. And I can tell you that the appointed process is every bit as political, perhaps even more, than the election process. I do believe, however, as Judge Woodruff said, that there ought to be minimum qualifications. And I do believe that public organizations, the Bar Association, the media, have, should play a greater role in educating the public as to who the judges are. Because most people go into the polls, they don't have a clue who they're voting for. I believe that the partisan nature of judges' elections should be removed. It's not about Democrat, it's not about Republican, it's about people who are going to be fair, who are going to be impartial, and who are going to do the right thing. When I was 35, I decided I wanted to run. As a Democrat, people said I was crazy, but I went out and knocked on doors and met people. Uh, the, the Republican Party got very riled up and campaigned against me near the end, but I won by 213 votes. 10 years later, my retention rate was 84.21%. That's the highest in the state on the computer over the last 10 years. Election's a good thing. I believe you are in a better position to decide than any senator or representative as to who your judge should be. And if you look back over our 370-year history, the oldest court in the nation, there have been a lot more good than there have been problems. The problems that we're all aware of, especially this year maybe with outside money and the other specters that are coming in, those can be fixed. But the fact is, you do not want to give up your right to select your judges. It's very simple. Who's going to pick the pickers? Are you going to let some group of probably white men sitting in a room decide who are going to be the judges for your county, or are you going to pick who the judges are going to be for your county? I can tell you that I was having a discussion about this the other day, and the judges on the Philadelphia Common Pleas Court much more fairly represent the population in Philadelphia. 50% are women, 30% are minorities, including Hispanics, Asians, and blacks. Then they do if you brought a group of people from our federal court into the same room, you would not see the same kind of population. Admittedly, there are 95 judges in Philadelphia. There are 1,500 judges in Pennsylvania. Some of them are gonna be bad. And no matter what you do and how much training you give them, some of them are still gonna be bad and maybe one or two of them are gonna be criminals. But I would much prefer to have you pre present my case to you than to present it to a board. Thank you. All right, thank you. Critics say one of the problems that Philadelphia and other counties have is that since the legislature has not allocated the necessary funds to run the county court system, general county funds have to be used instead, leaving our city with less money for schools and other institutions. What options does the court have to enforce its order that the state legislature make these funds available? Let's start with Judge Woodruff. In regard to funding, that's always uh, been a big issue. Uh, and not just here in, in Philadelphia, uh, but in Allegheny County and the small counties as, as, as well. You know, we have to revisit the funding stream, but all of that starts with you. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, you know, we have no authority uh, in, in regard to other than a small amount of funds, I think it's less than 1% of the total budget uh, that comes to the Supreme Court. Uh, but it, it's you uh, and, and how you elect your officials and legislators to determine how those funding streams uh, should be spent. And, and one of those issues in regard to schooling, you know, we, we elected a governor uh, uh, four years ago and all the cuts that, that he made. Well, you know, he, he indicated he was going to make those cuts and he did. And then we got a lot of griping for it. Well, that's why you have to make sure that you know the people that you're electing and that they have your same interests at, at heart. And so when you go back to the polls in May 19th and, and later in the year in November, make sure you're electing some legislators that believe the same way you do in regard to the funding streams. Thank you. Judge Allen. Our Supreme Court decided back in the late 70s, early 80s, that 
the state was responsible for funding the courts. So the question is, why has, has that order never been enforced? And I don't believe that, that that order or that case has been overturned. And I know that over the years there have been individual counties who have decided that they were going to just not fund courts because of the Supreme Court order. Um, but I believe that it's important for you, the people, to demand of your legislators and to demand of your county governments that that order be enforced. Because counties cannot fund the court. Many counties cannot fund the courts. And even Allegheny County is not in a position to fund the courts as the courts should be funded. So the order is there. It just needs to be enforced. I believe it was 1986 and the unified judicial system came into place and it was studied and overstudied and uh, we grudgingly moved along in the early 90s to bring, or late 90s to bring court administrators on board. It's supposed to bring all the court employees on board. It hasn't happened. Uh, I think back to when I was a law clerk and uh, a family case, the judge I worked for was giving a long lecture to a parent about what they were gonna do and the attorney chimed in and said, you can order me to fly, but it won't get me one inch off the ground. <laughs> The order's there, but I think the reason it hasn't been enforced is because of the overall funding and negotiation. I've personally argued as a president judge, it's time to end that negotiation. My staff that's directly under me should be on the state budget, and we should start moving to probation offices. The Supreme Court in this last year has moved to try and get an act to bring prothonotaries on board because for the appellate courts it streamlines records. But we really have to take a look at that opinion and go in the order it says and get people brought on so we have a truly unified judicial system that is promised by our Constitution. You know, whenever we the court deals with budget hearings, it seems very difficult for us to have to remind the legislature that we are the third equal branch of government. We're not treated as the third equal branch of government, and the court's budget overall, at least as far as I understand it, is less than 5% of the total budget of Pennsylvania. The Supreme Court has acceded to the fact that the state, that it is compelled the counties to pay for their own budgets. If the counties don't pay for the budgets, then there's going to have to be a decision made by the Supreme Court as to whether or not to enforce its own order or not to enforce its own order. I've heard that this is going to create a constitutional crisis. I don't think so. I think if the court, Supreme Court stands its guns, it will happen. It's often been said that the, that the court has neither the power of the sword nor the power of the purse. The purse is the General Assembly. The sword is the governor. All we have is our moral authority. But in our society now, in our system of government now, the word, the writ of the courts is honored. It wasn't always that way, folks. When Justice Story of the US Supreme Court issued a writ to President Andrew Jackson that he could not displace the Cherokee on the Trail of Tear Tears, Jackson said, story has his writ, now let him enforce it. Now the court's writs are enforced, and the court has ordered a unified judiciary, and kicking and screaming, the counties are coming along. It takes a long time, it needs to happen faster. But sometimes the courts have to threaten to sue the county commissioners, as they have done in Allegheny County, where I come from. And over time, the courts will be able to compel, if they have to, the General Assembly to fund justice in this commonwealth. Reggie. Thank you all for bearing with us. This is the final set of questions, and they are all short. <laughs> what? All short. We're going to start with Judge Allen for this question. What Pennsylvania Supreme Court case can you name that has been of great importance to women? Please briefly explain its importance. Of great importance. Pennsylvania Supreme Court that has been of great importance to women. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Supreme Court case that has been of great importance to women. 
There have been numerous family court cases, and in particular, and I point to family court cases because we have, uh, unfortunately, in our community, many families that are headed by women. And when I sat in juvenile court, unfortunately, most of the families that came through that court system were headed by women. And so I believe that some of the custody cases that have come through the Supreme Court, some of the cases that, have, that uh, impact support um, issues that have come before the Supreme Court are critical. Can I think of an individual or a particular case? At this moment, I cannot. But I do believe that the, the manner in which custody cases are decided, the manner in which support cases are decided, the support guidelines that have come down through um, our court are very beneficial and have been very beneficial to women. Thank you. Judge Foradora? I'm drawing a blank on your name. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, there, there are two companion cases from about three years ago, and they involved recusal of judges. One involved uh, Judge Cardwell Hughes from Philadelphia County. It was a death penalty case. In Ray White, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, the, the Clinton County bench had been horrendous in their expression of disdain for a mother in a case, in a children and youth case, and terminated her rights without her present. I think the Supreme Court took a painstaking amount of time to detail how uh, poor their action was and how justice was not served and understood this woman's individual circumstances. That's one of the cases I can point to that the Supreme Court really looked at the individual and ordered the entire bench recused and the matter reopened for reconsideration. I think that's a very important decision to mothers. You know, on the Superior Court, we write 350 opinions a year. And over the last five years, it's been about 1,500 cases. So I don't know that I can tell you the name of the case. But I do know that the Supreme Court affirmed a case on the Superior Court in which we affirmed a same-sex adoption by two women. And I think for the first time, that affirmed the rights of women to engage in same-sex adoptions and that they were to be treated no differently than any other couple that was adopting children. I think that probably set the most for women as independents in this state. Correct. And I would go on that. Thanks. Judge Wecht. Last year, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania rejected an appeal by the mother of a child who had been catastrophically injured in Bucks County. The case was Zoflik. This woman's daughter had been on a school bus and she suffered severe injuries in a car accident, in a bus accident and resulted in above the knee amputation and other lifetime injuries. And merely because of the accident that she was on a bus owned by the school district rather than a private company, she was subjected to draconian caps on her ability to recover damages. Had that bus been owned by the Acme Bus Company instead of the township or the school district, she would not have had those caps. I think the ability of parents to recover adequate damages should not be affected by an accident, like whether it's a school district or a private company operating the bus. Judge Woodruff. Sitting in family court, there are a lot of very important decisions that come down uh, that affect uh, men and, and particularly uh, women as well. Uh, but the one Supreme Court decision, uh, you know, I believe that affects women and particularly their, their families is, is SORNA, uh, the Sex Offense Registration and National Act. It, it's, I believe it's the third article under the Adam, Adam Walsh Act uh, that required uh, those uh, kids that committed certain sexual offenses uh, to register for life for a minimum of 25 years. That's devastating to, to a family. And what happens uh, is many of those kids that need treatment they don't come to court because that the alternative being have, having to register a child and you know that means every three months when they move they can't move without some type of registration as well. The, our Supreme Court struck that down because there was no scientific evidence that our children uh, could not be rehabilitated. And so I believe that was a, a, a good decision. Uh, the kids get that treatment uh, uh, without having uh, that lifetime registration over them. Thank you. Judge Fordor, we're going to start with you with this question. Can and should 
the Pennsylvania Constitution protect individual rights and liberties more robustly than the U.S. Constitution? And if so, in what areas do you see this occurring? The answer is yes. Um, in sexual equality is one that, that stands out where the United States Supreme Court uh, does not use a strict scrutiny standard, but that uh, is embodied in our state constitution with environmental protections. It's, uh, as we discussed in Robinson Township, that's not a right that's enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. Um, I'm thinking through, I'm sure there are more, but definitely as states are allowed to give persons uh, more rights than what the U.S. Constitution does, and that's a very important part of being in these United States, and I'm proud to say the Pennsylvania Constitution protects individual rights much better than our U.S. Constitution as handed down by the Supreme Court. A state constitution cannot give less rights than the federal constitution mandates. Pennsylvania gives far more rights to individuals than our state constitution. It's more strict in terms of dealing with rights of search and seizure. It has an environmental portion of its, its constitution, and there are numerous other places where our constitution is much more strict than the, Pennsylvania, than the United States Constitution. That's the way it should be because we guarantee we do better than what the requirements are from the state. Those are the minimum. That's the floor. I don't know that we've gotten to the ceiling yet, but we're getting there. I want you all to understand that the Pennsylvania Constitution can give more rights than the U.S. Constitution. But you need to understand that is not what your courts are doing. Your courts are imposing a draconian interpretation of the constitutional rights. So you should not be complacent and think that these greater rights are actually being given because they're not. You might have noticed the case last year that adopted the automobile exception to the search warrant requirement. Did you see that case, right? An automobile stop, basically fair game. Did you see the case that rejected the availability of expert testimony and false confessions? Has anybody heard anything out there about false confessions, right? In Pennsylvania, you can't present an expert on that. Search and seizure law, right? You're supposed to be able to argue that our rights to be free from unlawful search and seizure are greater under our Constitution. Show me a case where your appellate courts in Pennsylvania have actually held that recently. I'm in dissent a lot on this. Look me up. You know, I agree with my, my colleagues. When I look at the federal law, and normally, uh, in, in actually just about every single time, it, it sets a minimum standard. And it leaves it to the states uh, to be more specific in regard to the, what those laws sh should be. And that's the way it should be here in, in Pennsylvania as, as, as well. And so I am in agreement uh, with continuing that, that process. Uh, but for that to be a reality, for that to actually happen, you have to have some people that are on the courts that understand what the rules are, what the law is, and willing to stand up and make sure that, that it's followed. And so when you look at the, the strictness of, of certain states and the law that's there to give you those rights, it's, we have to employ all of our justices to make sure that you receive those rights uh, that you are entitled to. Thanks, Judge Allen. I agree that our Constitution, our Pennsylvania Constitution, arguably uh, expands upon the rights of its citizenry, and, and I mean expands on the rights as compared to the U.S. Constitution. Um, but when it comes to cases that come before our court, you know, we, every case is different. There are nuances, there are differences in the facts, there are differences in, in how the law can be applied to the, or the facts can be applied to the law and the law applied to the facts. And, and there is no uh, blanket uh, uh, manner of, ha and cannot be a blanket or a single manner of handling cases. And so I, I really have a difficult time when people say um, that every case is the same and that every case should be decided the same because they are not. 
You know, I believe that as judges, our job is to uphold the Constitution of the United States as well as the Constitution of Pennsylvania. Our job is to interpret the law as it is drafted and written by the legislature, and our job is to be fair and impartial in doing so. Thank you. This is the final question of the evening. <laughs> You're not a fan of us? Should I take this personally? Um, what role do you believe the court should have in mediating political power struggles between the executive and legislative branches, starting with Judge Lazarus? That is an issue that's actually before the court right now. And because it is before the court right now, I'm not going to speak to that, I, because there's a, an issue that's go, right now going on about the death penalty moratorium. And I don't think that that's something that I should speak to in this forum. That's something that clearly, uh, under the canons of judicial conduct, if there is a case that or controversy that is before, and I don't think that's the only one that I can think of that has been around, and I don't think I want to speak to that because that will be before us probably within the next year. Okay. Thank you. While we obviously can't comment on a pending case such as the moratorium case, we can comment on classes of cases. And I think the question asked about conflicts between the executive and legislative branches. So those happen frequently, and it is, um, it is quintessentially the role of our Supreme Court to resolve those, those disputes between the executive and the legislative branch. And they're to be decided, they're to be decided according to the Constitution and laws uh, with an understanding of the checks and balances in our government. You know, I agree with uh, uh, Judge Weck and as well as uh, uh, Judge Lazarus in, in regard to this matter. Uh, you know, there are always political struggles, and it's not something for the Supreme Court just to jump in at, at the beginning. Uh, but once it starts to infringe on our individual rights, once it starts to infringe and affect us uh, as individuals in this Commonwealth, uh, then I believe that the Supreme Court is employed to do to resolve those uh, particular issues. And uh, you know, as as we look, uh, it, it's becoming increasingly more intentious uh, as we go through uh, the political process uh, now, uh, not just here in Pennsylvania, uh, but also nationally as, as well. Thank you. Judge Allen. Well, our founding fathers um, established th three separate and distinct uh, branches of government, and the executive branch enforces the law, the legislature, makes the law and our job is to interpret the law. And so when there is a conflict between branches of government uh, and it involves a question of law, then it's our job as a court, as the Supreme Court in this instance, to interpret the law and apply the law uh, accurately. I agree that we cannot discuss and should not discuss cases that are pending before the court or that may be pending before us as a court but we also cannot shy away from our responsibility in taking on the tough questions, uh, even when there are strong political ramifications. So our job is to interpret the law. Thank you. Judge Foradora. I believe in deciding cases, it's a fairly easy or at least straightforward issue of being fair to both branches. I think your question was, can the court mediate between the legislature and the governor? In my career as a judge, there's been one time that stands out in mind that the mediation occurred, and that was with our late Chief Justice Cappy in 2005, uh, being part, uh, and in his political role, administrative role, of negotiating the pay raise uh, between the Senate and the governor that passed and then created a firestorm, which ultimately ended uh, Justice Nigro's career as a justice, which was unfortunate. He had done nothing towards that. Uh, ended many legislators' careers and put the court in a dark light for quite some time after that when there really was no wrongdoing. So I think as a mediator, there has to be some caution to not bring down the integrity of the court or its ability to decide the case when it comes. Thank you. So the last thing that we'll do is allow each candidate to make a one minute closing statement and we'll start with Judge Allen. Well, we've talked about many issues tonight and they're important issues 
and each of us has had an opportunity to weigh in and express our personal views, our opinions. But when it's all said and done, this race is not about our personal views and our personal opinions. Because as judges, while we all have those views, this race is really about justice. It's about justice in our court system. And what is most important is that we, as judges, um, dispense blind justice, not express our opinions. Now, many people believe that our court system and the justice has been broken in Pennsylvania. And as a result, um, we have, as many people say, become the laughing stock of this nation. But we can restore justice to the court system by electing judges who will not play politics, who will put politics uh, where it belongs, and that is outside of the justice system. And so I encourage you to take the question of justice into account. And let's leave the politics aside, because I believe that politics has been the greatest impediment to justice in our court system. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Reggie. Thank all of you for being here tonight. It's an honor to be in this great city discussing these important questions. As president judge of Jefferson County, I have the most, judicial, most diverse judicial experience of every candidate here. What the Supreme Court sees in maybe two or three years, I see and handle on a weekly and monthly basis in my court system, whether it's criminal cases from misdemeanors to murder, civil cases from small claims, up to million dollar cases, the family division, the orphans division. I manage and administer all of those divisions. I manage the employees, I set the budget. I've managed to work under the budget for 14 years and I've managed to lead my county by example. It is such an honor to be a judge, to be intimately involved in deciding important issues in people's lives. I wanna bring that same respect to the Supreme Court. And with your help, I can. If you wanna look me up, my website's votefordora.com. It's 42 days till primary election day. I'll bring a balance to the Democratic ticket by having a rural judge from the T to bring the votes out. I'll also bring balance to the court by having a rural judge who understands all of the issues in the state. So thank you again. Thank you for enduring the heat and God bless you. You know, it's almost like the elephant in the room. The one question that no one brought up tonight is the ethics of our past judiciary on the Supreme Court. And it's no question that our Supreme Court has been a mess over the last couple of years. One judge resigned under a cloud, another judge was indicted. I don't think it's enough for any of us to sit here and say that we won't be the judge that has a scandal associated with our name. That's not what the citizens of Pennsylvania need or should expect. What you want to elect are the best, the brightest, and the most ethical of the judges on the bench. That's what the citizens of Pennsylvania have a right to expect. I believe I bring the whole package. For 20 years out of the 25 years that I have been a judge, I have spent my time advising, teaching, and sometimes prosecuting judges who have not lived up to their ethical responsibilities. When the Supreme Court wanted their canons of judicial conduct rewritten, they asked me to head the committee that wrote them. That's what I've done, and we got a code that eliminates nepotism, judges sitting on for-profit boards, and delineates the responsibilities of judges in terms of their requirements for disclosure of their campaign contributions so that everybody can be confident that they have a judge that's fair and impartial hearing their cases. That will create a sea change on the court. And I ask that you think about how you want your judges to be, how you want your Supreme Court to look next year after this election. Thank you very much. I'm number five on the ballot, and I'm the only judge from Philadelphia. I, I want to thank the organizers for this heat lamp experience. Uh, I, I, I know what a meal feels like now, like to be the meal. Uh, I think I've sweated off about 10 pounds, so thank you for that. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, this election is principally about integrity, ethics, fairness, all the things you're entitled to from your Supreme Court, and unfortunately, you haven't gotten enough of. This is a time of great crisis. 
in our Supreme Court. But by golly, it's also a time of great, great opportunity. Three seats open in your hands. Fill those three seats with the most qualified, experienced, fair, and ethical justices that you can. I told you at the beginning, I'm the only candidate who's highly recommended by the PBA and endorsed by our state Democratic Party. And I told you at the beginning, I'm the only candidate who's come out with a comprehensive five-point ethics and transparency plan, ending gifts to judges, ending nepotism, not in our grandchildren's generation, not grandfathering all these people, ending it now. Putting cameras in our courtrooms, just like we got camera tonight recording this. Cameras in our courtrooms shine the light of day. Mandate judicial ethics training for all judge candidates, all of them. And mandate that judges tell you why they're granting or denying a motion to recuse. Please take this opportunity to vote for the most qualified, experienced judges. I'm David Wecht. I'm number one on the ballot. Go to my website, wecht2015.com, and above all, please vote, vote May 19. Thank you, and God bless you. I also want to thank you for this uh, uh, most uh, warm experience, uh, temperature-wise <laughs> and otherwise. Uh, but just to quickly tell you a little bit uh, more about my, myself, uh, I'm a hard-working kind of guy. I went to law school at night for four years while I was finishing up 12 years of playing with the Pittsburgh Steelers. I've been a lawyer uh, for over a decade. I, I, I've worked with, uh, in, in law, I've been appointed to serve not just statewide, but also nationally as, as well. I've been serviced in Allegheny County in Pennsylvania since 1979. We have a service-oriented family. It's, it's important to make sure uh, that who you elect understands the people that they're supposed to represent. I'm out in the community each and every day, walking the neighborhoods, talking to people, because if I'm going to make a decision in regard to you, I should know who you are and what your interests are as, as well. I think that's important. I'm transparent. There's nothing about me that you don't see, you can't read. Uh, when you look at, uh, you go on the internet, you can just put Dwayne in, and a thousand things are gonna pop up about me. So you can read everything that you want, go on my website, see what I'm all about, and, and understand that I'm hardworking, I'm experienced, I have integrity, I have responsibility, and I work for you. I'm number six on the ballot, think touchdown, number six. <laughs> Judge Woodruff. Gloria. I would like to thank the candidates on everyone's behalf here for sharing their time with us, their points of view, and their approach to uh, being on the bench. I was surprised that you all believe in uh, an elected judiciary. What that means is it puts a burden on us to become a knowledgeable electorate. Please tell your friends, your family, your neighbors that they should be watching the video of this that they should be reading uh, and about these judges, that they should look at their websites, that they should look at the Pennsylvania Bar Association's website, and they should vote knowledgeably for the three people they think will be the best uh, people to sit in this very high position. Thank you, everyone, for participating tonight. <laughs>